Hi, friends. I'm so excited to connect with you live today. Uh, we actually are so lucky in that we have we have at least one classroom live on camera who we're going to be bringing in in a little bit, plus all of you who are tuning in live right now via YouTube and those of you in the future who are going to be joining us when this is on demand. I'm going to be talking with my friend Tim live on board the SA Agullis 2 in just one second. But I do want to remind you that we are connecting live with a ship in the Weddell Sea off the coast of Antarctica. That means he may not have the best signal at times. He may even drop off or his, his signal might get a little fuzzy, but that's all part of the fun of being on a virtual exchange expedition like this one. So without further ado, I would like to welcome my good friend and colleague, Tim Jacob, uh, to our live stream today in the Antarctic, where we can talk about a lot of really fun stuff. Tim, hi, how you doing? Tim, wait, Tim, you're muted. <laughs> hey, Chris. Hi, Explorers. Let me start over again. <laughs> it's great to be able to connect with you all today. I want to personally welcome you aboard the SA Agalas 2. Um, as Chris mentioned, my name is Tim, and I am part of the Endurance 22 expedition. Um, we are currently stuck. I wouldn't say we're stuck. We are parked in ice in the Weddell Sea, uh, just off the coast of Antarctica, uh, in the midst of a search for Ernest Shackleton's famous lost ship, the Endurance. And I'm really, really excited to share that the ship, after many, many days of travel from Cape Town, South Africa, has arrived in the Weddell Sea. We've made our way through some lighter ice um, to get to the spot where 107 years ago, uh, Endurance sank. So we are in the vicinity of, of where the, the ship sank, which is very, very exciting. And we're now sort of using some really high-tech marine robots to begin the search underwater uh, for those, for that wreck, which is just incredibly exciting. That's so amazing. So. So I do need to make sure that I that I ask this. You are at the wreck site, correct? We have made it to the wreck site, and I can't say with 100% certainty how many ships have been to this exact spot in the world before, but I think it's like less than five. There are very, very, very few people in the world are lucky enough to get to be in this spot where we are. And just to give you a little sense of what is outside my window right now, there are. I, there's a seal sitting in front of the boat, a uh, crab eater seal laying on its side. Uh, didn't move at all as, as the ship approached. Um, it looks like it has eaten very, very well for a couple of years now and it's just kind of taking a nap on the ice. Um, there's a penguin right behind me out the door a little bit further than I can probably show you, but an emperor penguin with some beautiful yellow coloring on its neck. Um, just hanging out just before we started this call. It looked like it maybe laid down for a nap. Um, so we're in this frozen, amazing place um, that is just really, really magical uh, to be witnessing and sharing with you all. I mean, I think it's so amazing because sometimes when people think of places like Antarctica, that they think that it's this barren wasteland where nothing lives. And there are so many amazing living things, both above the water and below the water that call that part of the world home. Now, Tim, before we, we bring in your guests, um, I, I did see that we were able to welcome in Miss Ponzio's class from, from River Forest. They were a little bit late in joining us, but I believe you do have a a special message for, for one of Ms. Ponzio's students. Is that correct? I do. I need to switch briefly out of my explorer mode and into my dad mode because my wonderful son, Peter, I can see on the camera right there and it is his birthday tomorrow. So I want to say happy birthday to Peter all the way from Antarctica. I hope you have a wonderful day, buddy. I'm Ms. Ponzio's class. Thank you so much. <laughs> and Hello, and, and I, I will I will I want to echo that and say happy birthday as well. How exciting and wonderful. And also happy birthday to all of you who might be having having birthdays in the next couple of days. You are you are included in our celebration. But 
that being said, I do want to get this, this party started. Um, Tim, please, I know we've been talking a little bit about the excitement of, of ICE and, and, and what that means. And I know you have some really fun guests for us to, to learn from today. Please, let's, let's, let's get to know them. Right. Yeah, fantastic. So as you all recall, we've been talking for months now about what happened to the inference, that famous ship that Ernest Shackleton sailed down to the Antarctic. It got stuck in the ice, of which there is plenty around here. It got moved sort of through this swirling motion up through the Weddell Sea. And at a certain point, it got kind of jabbed in the sides with some ice that made it start take on water and it sank in the Weddell Sea. So ice is a really, really big thing here. And it is really all over the place, just the way it was uh, for Ernest Shackleton over a hundred years ago. So one of the things that was really, really important to the success of the Endurance 22 expedition right now is figuring out how we were gonna get through that same ice in our modern ice breaking ship and get to the sink site itself so we could start doing that underwater search for the wreck. And two of the people who were very instrumental in helping us get here are sitting right on the other side of the table from me and I'm so excited to introduce them to you. I'm joined today by Christian and Allie and they're both part of the ICE monitoring team. So I'm gonna turn this around and let you see them. You can see Christian there on the right and Allie on the left. And they are going to tell you a little bit about themselves. And they're going to tell you a little bit about what they do as part of the ICE monitoring team here on the SDA Gallus 2. Christian, let's start with you. Okay, I'm Christian. I'm from Germany. And I have been a polar researcher now already uh, for 10 years. But I'm actually, it's also for me my first, first time in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, because I have only been in the Antarctic so far. So. Yes, I'm, I'm 35 years old, have studied physics, which may sound boring to some, but actually you get to do pretty amazing stuff uh, when you're a physicist here. So uh, you can get a polar explorer and uh, look at the ice. And yeah, I have spent quite some time looking at ice. And as Tim already said, so it's really important when you want to look at the deep sea floor and look at, at something, find something, you really need to understand the ice and how the ice moves so that you're able to, to get to the spot. So that is one of my tasks here on board uh, to help bring us into the ice, but then also understand what the ice is doing here at the moment so that we can get the best out of the robots that we're using. Hi everyone, I'm Ali, I'm from Switzerland. So not really far from the ocean, so uh, I think I was 18 when I first heard of ships sailing in the sea, so in the Arctic, and I was like, that's just crazy to think that um, vessels are sailing through the ice. So I started to find some studies that was outside of Switzerland, so I went to Iceland, so I went to Norway, um, then I was studying how, how sea ice is melting in the Arctic, and I trying to kind of see if, there's, if the ice is melting or the ship's going there. So I was studying that, and... Um, like, thanks to that, I got this as opportunity now to be on the SAL Glass 2 and come to the Antarctic, which is super exciting because even though I was studying sea ice, I've never actually seen it. So just looking at images, satellite images, um, so it's kind of pictures from space. Um, and now I actually get to see it um, real and it is beautiful and super exciting. And just the noise of the ship going through the ice, like it's really, really cool. So, here on the ship, I'm making, um, making, downloading all these different images and pictures and data, um, putting them on one map. So just layering it out and figure out exactly where we are and how, what's the best way to, to get to the spot that we are. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Christian, do you want to show us, Ellie mentioned the way you're using satellite images to uh, see where the ice is and what it's doing. Uh, Christian has some things he wants to show us here. Some of the ways that he's using maps. So yeah. I, don't know, you can probably see this. So we have a big map of, we started up here in Cape Town. So this is just the Southern tip of, of South Africa. And then we have been sailing quite a long time, Tim has reported on, for you on that, uh, through the ocean and to a little storm here and then coming to Antarctica. And all the colorful stuff that you see here in, in the lower corner, 
uh, that is actually the, the sea ice. And well, obviously the sea ice is white and not, not purple or green or yellow, but we scientists always have draw, drew, pic, draw pictures in quite a funny way that actually it means where it's purple, there's a lot of ice and where it's just yellow or green, there's not so much ice. So we are actually very lucky because there's this year not so much uh, ice in the Weddell Sea and they could really nicely approach through the north and get to the wreck site with very low ice concentration. So uh, that is quite an exceptional thing for, for this time of year and we are very lucky. And even the ice that was there, which is quite dense, shown on the map, yeah, that that was even also easy to pass through. So we, we made quite a good progress. And maybe for you a bit to understand what how we know that this is ice. So there's satellites in orbit, like flying around the earth. And then they basically take pictures. It's not actually pictures, uh, but it's working on like the microwave. You, you know, the microwave oven that you have at home that is using a sort of energy that is heating up your food. And sea ice is also radiating some part of that energy. And so the sensor basically looks if there's a microwave open in the ice. <laughs> and if there's enough microwaves open somewhere, you can see it on the map. And that is how we know uh, where the ice is. Very cool. And, and, right. so, and um, so I just so, want to remind our, our, our classrooms that, um, that one of the reasons why this is really, really important for everyone on board to be um, to, to know about, uh, especially Captain Bengu, who, who we're going to be speaking with tomorrow um, uh, with our friends at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. The reason why this is important is that while, while the SA Gullis II is an icebreaker and it can go through and crush uh, crush some of this ice to make it through relatively easily. It can't do that to any thickness of ice. There is a limit, and it, and I believe it's it's three meters, correct? The thickness, the max thickness is three meters. It's really tough. Like for an icebreaker, there's no strict limit. It's just the thicker it is, the longer it takes. But mm. uh, for Agolas, if you have one meter of ice, it can travel through it with five knots, which we actually nicely demonstrated today, but <laughs> that is the limit. Yeah, so so remember, and, and I know and I know our friends at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, Joe is, always says this, take, when we're talking about meters, have go with your classroom and take out a yardstick or a meter stick. So when we're talking about one meter, that's that's the, the size of roughly a yardstick or a meter stick. So that's think about how thick that ice would be. And the and this ship can just easily go through that, but it can go through some thicker stuff. But like these these amazing scientists are saying, the 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 thicker it is, the harder it is. And so trying to figure out the best pass through, best path through makes it so much easier for for the expedition team to, to get to the spot and then to start doing all of the amazing science that they're able to do now. So uh, I know I, the thing I want to do right now is say, is say thank you to, to both of you for doing this and getting the ship there. I definitely couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> uh, but what a, what a fantastic <laughs> look into, into the, to the maps and the, the science that you all are doing. So, Chris, we have a couple more images um, to show the kids that they may enjoy. Um, let's see here. So, basically, we scientists use a lot of weird images. So, maybe let's start with an, with an easy image. So, this is a picture which is basically like just a camera looking out of a, a normal camera as you, you have it on your phone or just a camera that is looking out of a satellite. And here again, you can see the Antarctic Peninsula and you see the ice. And we came here from the north and this is where we met the ice edge. And that image allows us to see where there is enough ice. So everything that is white on this, this map is actually sea ice. So again, you see there was quite some, quite some dark spots. So the ice conditions were easy down to here where it brings us uh, to, the, to the wreck site. So, these images are really good for us to see and for everybody to understand because yeah we have eyes as humans so it's easy to to look at such an image but the problem is the weather is very bad here so we were very lucky to get one of these images but usually it's cloudy and we can't look for clouds so that's why it's really important that we also use other uh 
satellite images. And that is, for example, this image. And that is using radar waves, which is basically the waves that you are using to listen to the radio at home. And similarly here, the dark spots, they represent open water and the white spots represents ice. This is actually a big ice flow that we hit from the north yesterday and then we couldn't go through. So we had to go around uh, to start our survey below. And what is the blue line? So yeah, the, the blue line is something really funny. And I already told you that it's important to understand how the ice moves uh, so that we can know where we have to go with the ships so that we can deploy our robots in the right spot. And usually the ice is going in a straight direction. It's going north, going south or west or something. But when we arrived here, we were in a really confusing situation because sometimes the ice actually does something different. And what you see here is this, this blue line. This is the position of one of the ice flows in our area. And you can see that it is basically moving in circles. So it's giving us a very hard time to predict where the ice is going the next time. So very difficult to go to the right spot to, to find the wreck. Hey, Ella, do you want to explain how we got that blue line? Yeah, of course. So yesterday was really exciting. Um, was it yesterday? So I'm on night shift, so I'm always a bit mixed up with which day it is. So I actually just woke up, even though it's in the afternoon. Anyways, so yesterday, a team of scientists uh, got on a helicopter. So we have two helicopters on the ship, one for people, up to six people, and one for equipment if we wanted to, to build an ice camp. So that's something that might happen, not sure. So what we did yesterday, we got four, four people on the helicopter. We put a snow buoy. So a snow buoy that we put, it's like two meters high. Uh, half of it is just this big battery. It's quite heavy, like 60 kilos, the, the whole thing. <clears throat> so we put it on, so they flew to the ice, found this ice flow, put it on the ice, attached it. Um, so it's like this, was posed and it has like this basket. So it gives information on the snow, but also what's helping us is that it gives a GPS signal every hour, so exactly where it is. So that's why we're allowed us to get this blue line. So we're following this, um, the snow buoy that we put. How is that helpful for the search for the ship? So it gives us like a live uh, idea of how the sea ice is moving. So now, now where the ship is stopped, but we're actually moving with the whole sea ice pack. So like the whole level sea ice is moving and we're moving with it. And thanks to the snow buoy, we have a really like precise idea of how it's moving. And it's really funny to see these, these ellipses. So Christian was saying it's actually quite rare to see the ice go around in circles. So it's really exciting to see because we, so we have forecasts of three days. So they go in a straight line. They can't detect these small, um, little changes that we're seeing on the snow buoy. So it's really, really nice to compare these forecasts and what's really happening. It's really exciting to see. That's really amazing, especially because, I mean, I, I that by the way, that buoy, I, I just did, did a little bit of the math. So for, for my American uh, friends that are joining us, uh, 60 kilos is about 150 pounds. That's a really heavy buoy that they were able to drop onto the, onto the, the, the snow, uh, onto the ice. And, um, and, and so essentially it sounds like what you were able to do was create a, um, it's almost like the same thing that we can do, we can do with our cell phones and sometimes like track one another and say like, oh, so-and-so is there, we're going to see where they are. It's like, find my friends, except that it's find this ice flow. And so from that, we're able to collect and, and learn how everything is moving. How cool. How amazing. Yeah, Chris, um, we're, we're ready to do some questions. If, if there are students who have some yes. questions to ask. Yes, absolutely. So, um, so I, I, I do want to, before we, we start calling on some of the amazing students uh, at PS1 um, and, and in River Forest, um, I want to make sure to, to get to, to both, um, both Lincoln and, and PS1 in a second, but this is my call for all of, all of my friends who are joining us on YouTube. Start plugging those questions into the chat and we're going to start try and pepper those in as much as possible uh, as well. So uh, I'm going to call on Ms. Mesk first. So a student from Ms. Mesk's class and uh, Ms. Ponzio uh, that consider this to be on deck. Um, so we can go to we can go to Lincoln next. Go ahead, Johnny. This is Johnny. Okay. Go ahead, nice and loud. 
I wonder how big are the machines for like at the under the water? Underwater robots? Yes. Uh, did you guys hear that question? So the AUVs, yes, we were able to understand that question. The AUVs are pretty quite uh, quite big. You can imagine them, they are the size of a small car. They are about four meter long, one and a half, well, that's like 12 feet long, uh, one and a half meters wide. So that's like, what is it? Five feet, five feet wide. And they weigh one and a half tons. So similarly as a, as a, as a smaller car, and they are really difficult to, to navigate on the flow or on, on the ship. And it's, you really have to make sure that they don't drop on your fingers or on your feet because that would be bad. Wow. So, so essentially, you're, you, every time you're you're putting one of these one of these incredible AUVs into the water, autonomous underwater vehicles into the water, um, you're essentially dropping a Mazda Miata in and then having to pull it back out. Um, <laughs> that's incredible. Uh, all right, Miss Ponzio, uh, do you have a student with a question? Here we go. Can we see a photo of the helicopters? Please. <laughs> <laughs> Just gotta find it. <laughs> Here it is. You sparked uh, it. This was the to see was the helicopter taking off with the heli deck. Wait. Uh, yeah, we see it. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so you have the CIC that we'll see behind and it just took off. So that was yesterday, the helicopter heading for the, the ice flow that we chose to put our snow buoy. So I think it flew in the end four times, going back and forth, bringing people, uh, take, and then we took lots of samples of the snow and it was all thanks to this helicopter. <laughs> That's amazing. The pilots were very excited to fly after our long journey. They were, finally got to do what they love. Yeah, really yeah, happy. And and this and this is a this is a friendly reminder to um, to everyone because we uh, Tim and I were actually had the chance to speak with our um, with actually Mikhail who who runs the helicopters on board the ship on Monday and so you can actually on our YouTube channel you can watch that conversation on demand because he showed us in the helicopter hangar he showed us the Bell helicopter which is taking people around he showed us the KN which is a really funny looking one that uh, the funny looking one that that has that um, that has that very kind of like long nose that, that they call it like a, a, the truck to be able to bring lots of equipment. We, we got a really up close and personal look at, at all of that. So, so if you haven't had a chance to see that, go back and watch that amazing, uh, that amazing video uh, for sure. So um, let's, uh, let's see here, let's see here. Miss um, Mesk, does another one of your students have a question? Yes, uh, Victor, come on up. Hello. Don't see you. Go ahead. Um, uh, I want to ask you Victor, how um how is the how big is the ship? Did you guys hear that question? The ship? Yeah. It's it's really really nice ship. So it's um hundred meters long. How long is it? 20? 20, 20, 25 meters wide. Um, so you have up to, there's nine levels. So we're actually doing a lot of stairs, like going from our lab, which is on the third. And then I'm also going to the bridge to have a really nice view on the ice and to be able to look at, look at my computer, look at the picture that I have and look at the ice and be like, okay. And also have to, ha sorry, helping with the, the ice pilot who's also looking at our maps and looking around. So anyways, just going up and down, up and down the ship. Um, we have a really nice kitchen. Uh, we eat, we actually eat really good food, uh, even though we're really far from everything. The cooks are doing an amazing job. Um, I'm in a cabin, um, we're two, two girls. Um, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm pretty well, I'm happy on the ship. I don't know about you, Christy. 
No, it's a it's a really nice ship, and the best thing it's a it's an icebreaker, so we can go through through the ice actually. Um, it's really well prepared for what we want to do. It has all the facilities to deploy robots to do science. Uh, has a helicopter deck, uh, so yeah, it offers us everything that we need, and we can have a comfortable life here. It's nice and warm inside, and uh, sometimes even a bit too warm. <laughs> I've I've heard that that it's actually uh, it's I, I think some people are are it's because we're learning all about the um, the the endurance the 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 Imperial Trans uh, Trans Antarctic Expedition um, that that Sir Ernest Shackleton led uh, where the some of the experiences on board the ship even before the ship was crushed uh, by pack ice. Um, was it, it was it was a, a hard and lean living, I think we could agree with. Uh, and it sounds like things are a little bit, a little bit more enjoyable here. I mean, it's it's incredible that we're able to even speak with you. <laughs> uh, we did get a question from the chat, which I think is a really great one, um, which is: Are AUVs launched from the moon pool, or are they launched over the side? Um, and then, uh, and so there's a second part to the question, but I think that's a good one. And, and in that answer, could you actually uh, describe what the moon pool is for some of the folks who may not know? Uh, so the the moon pool it has a pretty cool name, but actually it is basically a hole in the middle of the ship, which is like two by two meters uh, large, and it is connected completely to the bottom of the ship. So you can imagine it's like a swimming pool uh, that you can, in principle, dive in and you end up on the bottom of the ship. Obviously, it's not a swimming pool for for us humans uh, because it's it's cold and also a bit dangerous. Um, but it's a very good swimming pool for equipment. Unfortunately, as I just said, it's just two by two meters. Uh, so our big robots that are that are much bigger don't fit through there. But we actually have to use the moon pool. Uh, so we deploy the AUVs over the the side or over the aft of the ship, uh, and then. We have in the moon pool, we have a, a communication antenna kind of. There is an, an acoustic modem that is over sound able to talk to the vehicle, uh, to the AUV. So that is why we need the moon pool to have this acoustic device, uh, this loudspeaker, you could say, uh, just down there in the water where it's not impacted by the ice. But every time that we move the ship and ice flows can, can go around, we have to retrieve the AUV, we have to pull the device up the moon pool, close the moon pool on the bottom, and then we can continue going and repeat from the beginning. Wow. Uh, I do want to just say a, a special thank you to, to Lincoln uh, in River Forest, Illinois. I think they have to break for lunch, but thank you all for being here. Uh, we have, um, I, I do appreciate you all being here, but um, but it, it's been so great to see you. And, and again, happy birthday, Peter. Um, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so I, I have another question from chat that I would love to, to get um, the answer on. And this is really for both of you. Uh, so how, how did you get interested in studying ice and where did you go to school? Yeah, so as I, for me, it was really ships and ice um, that got me interested. So I always liked the cold. Um, and then, yeah, reading that ships were going through the ice, I thought was really just fascinating, actually. And so, as I said, I'm from Switzerland, landlocked country. It's like, I'm not, studies in Switzerland are not going to bring me anywhere near, near the ice. So I went to Iceland and did a study there. Um, we'll see, it was kind of general study of everything that's related to, to the sea, so to the ocean. Um, and then I specialized in kind of got my way uh, on working and studying sea ice. So I was really more the, the fact that there were ships going through the ice that got me interested in the ice. Yeah, for, for me, actually, there was a, a really easy thing, my mother wanted to see polar bears. Uh, so when I was still in school, like you, at some point we, we went on a tourist trip to the Arctic to go and see polar bears. And apparently I liked it that much that I studied, continued my studies in the Arctic 
And when I was studying up in the Arctic, I took classes on, on sea ice and I liked it. And afterwards the stars lined up so that I could, could stay uh, researching sea ice and, and continue that work. And I still love working with sea ice. It's, it's an amazing medium to work with. And, and particularly because there's not so many people that get to go on these nice expeditions. But, but also it's very hard uh, to understand how sea ice moves, how it forms, how it melts. And we still haven't understood everything. Like these little circles that I showed you before in the drift pattern, scientists haven't really well understood yet how they are, why they are, and, and how we could even model them. So, so that's what is really the interesting thing about sea ice and what, what keeps me working with sea ice. I think that's a really important thing for, for all the classrooms who, who are watching this and will watch this to, to be able to understand, which is that, that when we're talking about all the things that we know and that we, we have learned about, about sea ice and physics and, and all of this stuff, there's still a lot that we don't know. And, and how exciting is it to, to go on expeditions like this and, and to continue to learn? And so for all of you students out there who are who are, are looking at other things uh, and, and are excited about learning things that you could get to to the heights of your field. You could you could study and go to to and earn many different degrees, and you're still learning, and that's the exciting thing. And I know I know Miss Mess, this is this is a big um, a big thing that that we've talked about before as as teachers is that is that how exciting is it to always be be continuing to learn, and, and what a, what an exciting gift that is. And so before I go into some more live chat questions, uh, I want to to allow for another one of Ms. Mess students, please, if you have another question, uh, we would love to, to do our best to answer it. Nihal, uh, come on up. All right, remember he needs to see you, so bend down a little, okay? Hold the mic right to your mouth. When, when the Tim is gonna give a tour? <laughs> Me uh, very much like a tour right. of the jet. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I I will get on that. I have been exploring this ship myself. It is so big, and there are so many little passageways to go down. That I promise you that the the tour will be coming soon. I've taken a lot of pictures, but I think it's time for a video. So uh, I'll work on that right after we hang up today. That's, I mean, I, Miss Mesk, I, I, I feel like, I feel like your, your students are in the Reach the World office because we're actually working on an article on the Reach the World website right now that is looking at different, different parts of the ship. And so, uh, and so students can learn also just the basic vocabulary of the ship, stuff like port and starboard, fore and aft. Uh, so all those things that, that, those of you on the SA Agullas 2 are, are, are well versed in now. We, we want to all be able to speak that same fun, um, that fun language of, of being on board. Um, so I, I want to ask a version of that question to, to our guests, which is for each of you, uh, what, is, what is your favorite part of the ship so far? <laughs> I don't know. So I have a have a clear uh, favorite part at the moment, and that is called the Monkey Island. And that is a that is an observation platform on on top of the ship. It's almost outside on deck, and you have a have a nice overview over the ice, and you can can watch for animals, you can watch for the ice, and and everything. And by the way, if you're really curious to see uh, what is going on on the ship, you can also go on on my YouTube channel called Sea Ice Stories, and there I actually have two videos with a tour on of the ship. So if you're interested and can't wait for Tim's video, then you can go there and, and, and check it out there. But I bet Tim's gonna show you some more special places that I don't even get to. <laughs> Uh, I think my favorite spot on the ship is uh, in the front, in the bow, and just standing there while we're breaking through the ice is is really just it's beautiful. It's, I really just love that. And you also see on the sides like just some penguins being like, "Oh, there's a ship coming. I'm just slowly gonna move." Like they're really not that scared. So it's it's really beautiful to be on the front of the ship and just seeing seeing us break the ice. I think those are two really great, really great choices. And 
Um, and we actually heard I uh, with our live stream yesterday that that Joe, uh, our friend Joe at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants led. Um, we heard a little bit about that that really special place where you can um, that where you can observe the entire you can observe the entire uh, wildlife from there. And, and it was like such a, a special, it sounded like such a special spot. Um, I actually just heard from one of my colleagues that the um, the article that I mentioned about looking at different parts of the ship is actually live on the Reach the World website. So so uh, so please check, take a look at that if you haven't already. Um, now, uh, we have a really good question here uh, from, from the chat that I would love to ask. And, uh, and this was, this is a little bit historical and me as a former social studies teacher, I love this type of question, which was, did the discovery of the Erebus and terror ships, the, the Franklin expedition ships in the Arctic, color your approach to the search for the endurance? Uh, so, so tell us about that. <laughs> well, I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be honest, the, the, the Erebus and Terror, in, in, they are lying in the, in the Northwest Passage, basically, in, in, in northern Canada. And this is a very different ice regime. Uh, so the Erebus and Terror, they, the sites in summer become ice-free. So they, there's still ice drifting around in that area, but it's by far not that much ice cover as, as here. So... Definitely, we're using some similar techniques, like the techniques that the, the, the AUVs are using, the, the sonars they're using are very similar to find the wrecks. Um, but that is applies to everything that you search at the at the at the seafloor. So I wouldn't say that these uh, shipwreck finds particularly influenced uh, this decision because, uh, yeah, it's a quite different setting and you have to mount a much bigger expedition to get here to the Weddell Sea and bring very different uh, technologies. I think I think the key thing that, that I heard there, which I think is really important, is the importance of the, the difference of the ice and how and the scientific approach to be able to get the ship there. Uh, so again, the importance of, of doing all of that work of, of Using the satellite data to be able to look at to look at through radar, through through satellite imaging, and to then try and predict by dropping those floats, you have to do all of that work, uh, in this case because there's still ice there, even though it's the summer in Antarctica versus in the the summer in in the the northern hemisphere where it becomes a little bit clear. Uh, Miss Mess, do you have another question from PS One? Yes, we do. We actually have two more students, three more students with questions. Joshua, come on up. All right. Um, is the ship more bigger than the Titanic and um, how much does it weigh? <laughs> Actually, I don't. Already with the Titanic, what was the size of the, of the Titanic? I don't have it in mind. That the Titanic was longer, definitely, mm -hmm. and, and, and bigger ship, but it was not an icebreaker, so it was a completely different ship. So I don't know what Agulas is weighing. I would need to look it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, couldn't even give a guess of how, how much the ship weighs. There's, there's other specialists on board here that know that better. Oh, yeah. I would being able to answer your, your question, Joshua. It's it's a good question. It's a really good question. But I would I would say suggest too that that uh, Miss Mess class, if you can, be sure to join our our live stream tomorrow with Captain Knowledge Bengu, uh, because I have a feeling he might know the answer a little bit more clearly since he is the the captain of the ship. Uh, he knows things like like how big his ship is because he's the one who's responsible for making sure it gets safely to and from its destinations. Uh, uh, Ms. Mess, do you have another student that is that is ready to ask a question? Yes, Elisha, come on up. I my question is, did you bring any paranormals? Because I know the object is pretty cold. Um, I'll just repeat that in case you didn't hear it. He would like to, Elisha would like yeah. to know if um, you brought any hand warmers because he knows that Antarctica is very cold. 
Uh, yeah, we we did. So actually, already in November, we got went to we were in Germany and we tried on all this polar gear. So we got from our base layer of like really warm wool to like another jacket and like a really warm jacket. And we even had like these whole overall really and they're red and they're so they're super warm. We just put that on. I mean, then we have the hats. Uh, we even got goggles in case, like if it gets a bit windy, like it gets, you don't want that cold wind to get in your eyes. So we had these, these goggles and of course, really warm boots. And uh, I think I brought a, a lot of wool socks because um, wool is, the, is that base layer of wool is the really important. I, I think it's important to mention too, for, for those of you, Antarctica is very cold, but the only reason that, that this expedition is able to get to the Endurance wreck site is that it is summer in Antarctica right now. It is in the Southern hemisphere, which means that they are sort of on opposite seasons from us in the Northern hemisphere, those of us in New York City, which I know PS1 in Brooklyn is. And so think about that, that it is actually summertime there. So it's actually way warmer than it will be in all of that area that is open, all of the, the, the different pathways that, that, that uh, these scientists are trying to find. That's only open because the ice is a little bit more melty right now. And so as cold as it is, it actually gets colder. Uh, so I have I have one question from the uh, one question from the chat that I want to get to before giving the last question to Ms. Mesk's class, which is um, how far underwater can this AUV, AUV go? Uh, and, and, uh, and so maybe in terms of, of distance, and then also can it reach the, the ocean floor? And I think I know the answer to the second part of that question. So the answer of the second one is actually not as trivial as you might think, <laughs> but yes, we can reach the ocean floor, but actually in, in some areas of our search window, we are just at the limit to where the vehicle can get. So if the maps turn out to be wrong, there might be spots where we really can't get down. Luckily, the sonar can, can bridge that gap, so we for sure uh, can use these things. Otherwise, how far can they go? Well, there's two aspects. There's time, because these vehicles, they just have a very light, thin tethered as they bring their own batteries with them. And these batteries, they last about about nine hours and we need time to dive down to 3000 meters depth and we need time to dive up from 3000 meters depth so they have a survey time of about six hours and during that time they doing a speed of uh, of two miles per hour uh, actually oh, when they do a survey so you can get quite some distance with them also um the other limit is the vehicle has a cable on it. And of course it can't drive further away than that cable is, but that cable is 25 kilometers to the max. So it's even longer than, than what we could do just based on the batteries. So it really gives us the good opportunity that when the ice drifts somewhere where we don't want to go, we have a very long cable that we still can use the AUV to go uh, where we want to go and then come back to the ship. And, um, and I, I, I think the, the thing that's really interesting to me about these, these autonomous underwater vehicles is that um, they, they, they are mostly an autonomous underwater vehicles. So they, they work as drones, they can sort of do their own thing, but then they can, um, they, we can sort of switch them to more of like a remote operated vehicle mo mode in case, in case someone on the ROV team or the AUV team sees something. Uh, and so, and so we're able to sort of do both, and and that is that is important as as the I know the search is underway, and and uh, and so trying to figure that out. But um, but but just so you all know too, to con that conversion, three thousand meters is about ten thousand feet. So so think about around your school how long ten thousand feet is, and then think about how how long it takes for for something to get down to that depth. And and if if you didn't catch it yesterday, uh, we did with, with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, a wonderful video call with Men's and Bound, where he talked a little bit more about that, how long it takes for these AUVs to get down there, uh, and, and also paying attention to that battery life. Um, I did hear from one of my coworkers that the Titanic was 880 feet long, about twice as long as the SA Agullis II. 
Um, but as as you have have already said, the the Agullus is designed to break through the ice and designed in, in a much different way than the Titanic was. Um, so, Ms. Mesk, I know we're we're running a little bit low on time. Um, do you want to do you have one more question for for our guest today? Go ahead, Yasker. Um, I want to know if how many pilot no how many captains captain do you have? The question is, uh, he wants to know if there's like a backup captain, if something happens to the first captain. Yeah, so there, on the bridge, there's, sorry, there's two captains. So one captain, one ice pilot, and they are six hours, they work six hours each. So one works six hours on the other one. So they're always, there's always a captain on the bridge. Um, the people working on the bridge, I think there are seven. Um, and there always has to be three to four um, working. So watching the sailing the, the ship. And that's, and that's yeah. similar to, to what the expedition is doing in general, that in, in most cases, you were just saying you're, you're on the night shift. So you're, you're doing your 12 hour shift at night with, with your work and, and most of the different jobs on board the expedition, there are people who are on a night shift working 12 hours and people who are on a day shift working 12 hours. And so there's con there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there are people who are doing their jobs on board the ship and everyone has to always be doing their job. There's no calling in sick. There's no, uh, I don't feel like going to work today, not on board the SA Agullis too, right? <laughs> no, if, <you're, laughs> if you can work, you're, you're gonna you do your shifts. So like we just, yeah, just started like really being on these 24 hour shifts and we still got to go for another 10 days at least if not more so let's see how it goes <laughs> it, it, this is the exciting time right this is this is where, what we've been waiting for for months and months and months so i i do want to express my my sincere appreciation to to uh, our students at PS1, our students who had to leave a little bit earlier uh, in at uh, Lincoln Elementary in River Forest, and all of our students in classrooms who are joining us uh, live on YouTube, and, and those classrooms who are gonna be joining us in the future, hello, future students, uh, as well as, as our amazing guests uh, aboard the SA Agullis too. Uh, I, I, uh, I am in, in such uh, honor, awe and appreciation of the work that you're doing, the time that you're giving to us, uh, and the fact that we're able to talk to you live through satellite to be able to, to see all of the amazing things that you're doing in real time as it's happening so many miles away from where I'm sitting here at our office in New York City. So, uh, so thank you all so much. And, and those of you who haven't done so already, please visit uh, explore.reachtheworld.org for to register for Reach the World and to see upcoming events. I've mentioned already that tomorrow we will be speaking on a live stream with Captain Knowledge Bengu and where we will be uh, speaking with a number of other amazing members of the expedition crew and the, and, uh, the, the amazing people who are working uh, tirelessly to keep, the crew, to keep the crew fed and supported over the next few days. So please take a look at all of that and, uh, and, and Keep watching all of the amazing videos that we have on YouTube. Um, so before we go uh, today, I, I want to make sure that we unmute Miss Mess's class one more time, just so you can say uh, a, a hearty thank you to, to our expedition scientists, to Tim, also to Seely Shackleton, who I see is in, in front of you, our newly named mascot. <laughs> um, so Miss Mess. Uh, guys, can we say thank you? <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank you all so much for, for being with us today. We have some amazing, exciting events coming up, hopefully some exciting news. Please keep an eye on www.reachtheworld.org for the latest updates with regards to the expedition. And, uh, and with that, I'll, I'll leave you all today to enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.